Thank you, Frank. Good morning, PBC family, and to our friends online watching and live stream. Uh, I'm Wes Rahani, one of the elders here at PBC, and I'll be leading our study this morning while Scott and his family are on a much needed vacation. Well, making the right call. Well, what does it make, take to make the right call in the midst of divisive times, economic uncertainty, pandemics, political, social unrest? Decisions that need to be made and judgments to be passed. We're all being put into those situations now more than ever. As a family, as individuals, as a country, as a people, and as a church. I'm reminded of some decisions that we had to make as an elder body and as a church over the past few weeks around social unrest and how we dealt with it. So making the right call is becoming more and more critical. Winston Churchill once said, there's only one duty, only one safe course, and that is to try to be right and not to fear to do or say what you believe to be right. Well, during the first week of 1940, Churchill took one of the most pivotal and controversial decisions of the war and probably of his career. You see, earlier the French had decided to sign a treaty with the Germans. They surrendered. And the Germans decided to keep their navy as is. They didn't touch the French navy. And the French navy was very powerful at the time. So they let the ships sit in major harbors. One of those was at the Horn of Africa. And Churchill, fearing that the Germans would eventually use that navy, and he needed that navy to combat the Germans, reached out to the French, a puppet government that the Germans had put in place and asked them to not use the ships, to scuttle the ships, or better yet, give me the ships so I can use them against the Germans. Well, the French didn't respond. So the next thing in that first week of July that Churchill did is ordered his navy to go to that major harbor and surround those ships. The French admiral was sitting and waiting to see what the, the English would do. And they gave him a six-hour ultimatum to the French. Scuttle your ships or give them to us. Six hours went by, nothing happened. Nobody responded. The French admiral didn't think that the English had it in them to do anything. Uh, what do you think Churchill did? He took a decisive decision, and he bombarded the ships. He downed all of the ships. And with it, over 1,300 French sailors died that day. Well, Churchill was judged for that decision. A lot of people criticized him, but there was one man that saw it a little bit differently. Our president, Roosevelt, saw it very differently. You see, Roosevelt was waiting for a moment to see if the English would have it in them to withstand the pressure, to make the right decisions, to make the hard calls. And Churchill, in the eyes of Roosevelt, did. And that was a pivotal moment that Roosevelt saw that allowed him to enter the war. And we know the history after that. Now, whether you think that was the right call or not, it was a tough call. He took 1,300 people to their death. But can you imagine if he didn't and that fleet would have been used against him in the war? What would have happened to England then? What would have happened to Europe after that? A critical decision. Making the right call, a tough call. Well, I see many similarities between Churchill and the Apostle Paul. Mind you, not from a spiritual uh, perspective, but from just a life perspective. See, both men come from a privileged background, an educated background. They were experienced, eloquent, both in written and oral traditions. We know how Churchill was orally, right? He can speak, and we know how Paul spoke. We know the letters that he wrote. Well, they both had to stand up for what they believed in, regardless of the judgment of their fellow man. This quote of Churchill really sums up a sentiment that Paul was conveying in our scripture passage to the Corinthians over 2,000 years ago. Well, before we get into our passage, let's recap a little bit. We've been studying Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. Written around 55, 56 AD, Paul writes to a group of people that he led to Christ through his mission work. But this group had some trouble, right, if we recall. 
one of the areas they struggled with was church divisiveness. Well, today we hone in on, on one of the reasons that was causing this divisiveness in the church, and it does so today as well. They put their leaders through a microscope and began using their worldview, the, church, the Corinthians' worldview, their worldly wisdom to choose a favorite leader to a point where Christ was put on the same pedestal, the same level as Paul and Apollos. They made bad calls. Well, to better understand the situation that Paul was addressing, we really know, need, to, need to know a little bit of history of Corinth. See, Corinth was a long-established city at the center of trade, very close to Athens, um, at a harbor. So it was a port city. It was very important strategically. And in 44 BC, Julius Caesar set up a colony at Corinth, a Roman colony. Well, that colony mixed with the local population. So you had Jew, you had Greek, and you had Roman. All the makings of a crisis. You see, each had uh, allowed their culture, their background, their beliefs, their own people, to color and jade their decisions, their affiliations. Sound familiar today? Or it's very similar today in a culture standpoint. Many of the residents there were well-to-do and educated. And as with any civil society, there was great discord on philosophical matters. See, we studied last week how the Corinthians relied on the wisdom of the day. We all remember that, right? Much like many of us do today in practice. This heavily influenced how they viewed church leadership to a point where they had favorites. Well, they began to make calls about these leaders, their decisions, how they carried themselves, and they began to pass judgment on them, on how they led, how they taught, how they carried themselves. So this got beyond favoritism. Things got judgmental. Well, when you start to compare and look through a lens than, other than God's, well, there's no compass anymore. There's no standard. So things were so out of alignment at Corinth that Paul had to say something. Well, in chapter 1, verse 11, it says, For I have been informed concerning you, Paul is saying, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. You see, all men were placed equally, even Christ, in that sentence. Well, it's much like what is happening today in politics. Almost every conversation we have ends up with, who do you support politically? Or we're asked to pass judgment, to take a stance. And rightfully so, as we get into a presidential election. Over the weekend, uh, Rita and I had some friends over, and eventually we got into the conversation, right? We started talking, we agreed on some things, disagreed on others, and eventually we were asked, who do you like? And what do you think happened? As many of you and us would do, we started to judge. We started to pass judgment on men, right or wrong, right? We had judgmental things to say. You see, this is what was happening to the church in Corinth. It only moved from the political and philosophical realm to the spiritual now. It stopped being political. It started to become spiritual. The church began comparing their leaders and their eloquence, and then judging their competency. Well, with that backdrop, we come to our five verses, and we'll see how the Holy Spirit through Paul puts on a leadership lesson for the church, for church leaders, those who seek ministerial positions or roles, and all of us in general, on how we should view those leaders, and more importantly, how we should be making the right call. We'll read again. So 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 5. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court, in fact. In fact, I don't even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself. Yet I'm only, I'm not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. But wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring the, to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then 
Each man's praise will come to him from God. Well, there are three main ideas that we'll focus on in this passage that will allow every leader or every churchgoer, for that matter, to focus on making the right call. Those things are humility, faithful stewardship, and God's judgment. Paul instructs the reader to think of us. Well, who is us here? Who's he talking about? Well, for that, we go back again to chapter 1, and that verse we read, verse 12. Now, I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas. Well, he's referring to church leadership, right? Paul, Apollos, and Peter. Each of these men were well established by, by now in the church, and each had the opportunity to teach, to preach, to witness, baptize, and minister to many. Apollos was a Jew from Alexandria. He was described as eloquent, mighty in Scripture, fervent in the Spirit, instructed in the way of the Lord, Acts chapter 18, verse 24. We all should know who Paul is, right? We've been reading about him, and we've been reading his work. And we know who Cephas was. Cephas, by the way, is the Aramaic name Jesus used for Peter. Well, so Paul is putting all of these men, including himself, on the same level pay- playing field. See, he viewed each man as his brother, his co-laborer. There's no ambiguity on his mind on who is better or worse. Us, the same level. Well, then Paul says, view us as servants of Christ. Now, bear with me. I'm going to go a little bit Greek on you, all right? Well, I haven't been attending William's class. If you haven't, please do. William Thayer is teaching a class on Greek. And those of you who have taken that class will understand the importance of scriptural etymology, all right? The study of word origins. Well, as it makes a world of difference in how you read the scripture, if you understand what the original text meant. This word servant here is the original Greek, and the original Greek is hupiritas. Hupiritas Christau, or servants of Christ. This word originated from the servant slave under rower to be an exact definition, on ships, on military ships. Typically those on the bottom level, rowing day in and day out, rowing the big oars to move the ship forward. Well, as servants or slaves rowing at the bottom of a ship, you all know how they were probably treated. Suffice it to say, we don't need to go into that detail this morning, but we know their life wasn't easy. See, this is how Paul wanted his flock to view him and his fellow laborers. They are there to serve the needs and the bidding of Christ. Well, what's the bidding of Christ? Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Now let's compare this word, hupertas, or or servant or slave in Scripture, to another word. We most often see the word daikonos, or table waiter. Daikonos comes from the word, or we get the word deacon from that, and we'll have our deacons serve us later. But the word here, hupiritas, is closely related to a laborer, a servant or a slave working in the bowels of a ship, rowing and making the ship move. He wasn't there to serve in public. He was there to be at the bowels of the ship, underneath, hidden, rowing and working, working tirelessly, day in and day out. You see, this is what Paul was serving towards. He wanted Corinth to know that he was there not to be eloquent or well-dressed or a great business manager. He was serving Christ, end of line, full stop. This was humility. He wanted to be called a hopiritas, a servant of Christ. Nothing more. This is what colored his decisions, his judgment, and not the favoritism of the Corinthians. He was not there to be called the best preacher, teacher, evangelist, pastor, or any other title, but rather a humble servant, a hopiritas Christal, a servant of Christ. See, he took to heart Christ's teachings for those who want to be first shall be last, to wash the feet of his fellow man, to serve and suffer for Christ and for the kingdom of God. In 2 Corinthians, Paul points out that he was whipped 
to an inch of his life, 39 lashes, five times, for preaching the word. And by whom? His fellow Jewish brothers. You see, he suffered. He was ostracized. He was jailed. He was prisoned. He was tortured. All for what? For serving Christ and his great commission. This is humility. When we go about life and our decisions with this humility, the outside world doesn't matter. See, at the bowels of a ship, you didn't have a window. You didn't see the outside world. What you saw was the oar you rowed day in and day out. You worried about moving the ship, moving it forward. You worried about your fellow brother rowing with you in unison. That is what you worried about. You didn't worry about what this person thought of you or this person didn't. You were all there in the same boat, rowing in the same direction, heading the same way. Well, let's read on. Let, man, let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. So we talked about humility. We now come to the next point that Paul is trying to teach. Leaders, teachers, pastors, elders, all of us are stewards, or the original word oikonomos, of God's mysteries. So bear with me, another quick Greek lesson. Sorry, William, I'm taking your thunder here. The word oikonomos, steward, is a formation of two words. Oikos, meaning house, and nomo, rule of law, distribute or apportion. So an oikonomos is a hypiritas, a servant that has a special place to manage or apportion. So an oikonomos is the hypiritas, the servant that has a special place to manage, to rule the house or the affairs of the master. You see, this is what Joseph did. If you remember, Joseph was an oikonomos of Pharaoh's affairs. He was placed as second in command. He had full control of Pharaoh's financial affairs. He ruled over them. He judged. He took steps. He made calls on who got what, when. What did they do with the affairs of Pharaoh? He was second in command, but he was still a servant. He was an oikonomos, but he was a hyperitas of Pharaoh. He served his master's estate. Well, my wife and I enjoyed watching, watching Downton Abbey, so I'm sure many of you recognize this man from the show. On the show, Charles Carter plays Mr. Car Mr. Carson, the beloved family butler, who was a servant as well. But he was entrusted to be a steward of the affairs of the, of the home. You see, Mr. Carson was faithful to the family and the estate. He was trusted to have the best interest of the home. This was a role that was held by Mr. Carson for a long time until he retired. But even then, Mr. Carson held sway over the decisions in the house. He would be asked about some of the decisions they would make. The servants would still reach out to him. He was faithful. He held himself and his staff accountable and maintained the stature of the house. But Paul is referring to himself in much the same way. He was a steward of God's mysteries. And as we have studied in the past, when Paul refers to God's mysteries, he's referring to God's word, preaching the gospel, the good news, the mysteries of God. The little more word history. One of these words, gospel, good news, or in the original Greek text, evangelion. You know what, what leads us to an evangelist, right? An evangelion in Roman times was used by the emperor's cult to proclaim the good news that the new Romer has ascended to the throne. You see, it was a revelation to the masses of the new emperor. It was an evangelion of the new emperor. So it was on Paul to be a steward of the revelation and proclamation to the world of the ascension of Christ to the heavenly throne. Some believe that this was one of the reasons Paul was so persecuted by both Jew and Roman. His actual use of the word gospel, evangelion. But it really wasn't much of that. It was more that he was proclaiming the gospel of another ruler other than the emperor that got him in a ton of trouble. This is the role of a pastor, an elder in the church, to serve in humility and to be a good steward 
on the authority given to them to run the affairs of the church, of preaching the word to lead the church spiritually, to make the right call and place the gospel first. There was once a very wealthy man who had a childhood friend that, was a, that became a carpenter, a master carpenter. With this childhood friend, this carpenter, got into some troubled times. And this wealthy man wanted to help out his friend. So he commissioned him to build a home, prepaid for the home, and gave carte blanche to the carpenter. Go build it. Here's the money. Build me a home. Build it as best as you can with the best things you can put in there. This carpenter went about to do it. And at first, he started doing things what he thought this builder would want. But then he started to cut corners. He started to use less than quality material. He started to use less than quality workmanship. And he would pocket the difference to help himself out of that hole. Well, when the day came to hand over the house to the owner, the owner came and the wealthy man took the keys without going inside, without checking anything, cheerfully, having paid for it, handed the keys to this carpenter. This is your home. How do you think this man felt after doing that? Well, you see, this is what happens when you are found less than faithful. It has profound consequences on your life. When Paul called out the church in Corinth, he was asking them not to judge him or Apollos, since they were equally faithful and equally servants. Not one can stand over the other. Making the right call requires us to be good stewards, all the way to look at what God has called us to be, to be faithful. See, for church leaders, it's the gospel. For you, it may be your work. It may be your wife, your husband, your job, your school, or a simple task you're given at work or at home. See, make the right call with faithful stewardship. It's not about leading a church committee. It's not about having my way or the highway. I want to chair this project or that project. It's about stewardship in humility. And what we're talking about here is stewardship of the gospel. Let's not forget we are placed to be stewards of the good news. It's about rowing and rowing. It's about preaching the word of God. So we now come to the third point that Paul makes in, in, this, in this few verses, and it's God's judgment. It's God's judgment that should be the ultimate influence on our calls for our decisions. Well, in order to highlight God's judgment, Paul compares this to man's judgment, our own self-judgment as well. And he highlights how short we come in comparison to God's judgment. Let's read again. Verse 2, in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards, us, that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it's a very small thing that I may be examined by you, or by any human for that matter. Start to scratch your head a little bit here. Where's humility in this, right? Well, what he's talking about here and what type of judgment is talking about here is to be found trustworthy to be a steward of the mysteries God, but not by man. He considers the judgment of his fellow man in accomplishing the task or the trust he's been given as a small thing. It didn't phase him. It didn't motivate him. He didn't fear it. You see, man's evaluation is flawed. It's based on a sinful nature. It's biased. It doesn't see all things. It doesn't see deep into the heart. God looks at the potential of the pot of clay, and he doesn't have to really worry about what it's made of. He can fill it. He can fix it. Minimizing man's judgment gives freedom to the servant. Man doesn't have to worry about what human evaluations can do. It's Christ that writes his performance review. Now, it's not to say that it's not important to listen to man or take their input and feedback. We're not an island on our own. What Paul is talking about here is the judgment on stewardship of the gospel. He's not talking about accountability. He's not talking about sin or immorality. He's talking about what we are doing with the talents we have been given. Well, when was the last time you had a performance review? I'm sure many of us in the working world have had to go through one or two of these, right? And for those of you heading out to college or starting out a career, 
you're going to have to get used to that word, performance review. And by the way, you're going to have to get used to the word feedback, judgment. Feedback is a gift. How many of you have heard that word and probably cringed at that statement? I have a few times in my career. Well, see, as much as it is a gift, it's a very stressful time. Evaluations can be difficult, can be challenging, because they call out your faults. But sometimes it's faults that you probably don't agree with. See, it's a point in time where your boss evaluates your work. He passes or she passes judgment on you. And for some, it can very, be very contentious because the boss may not have known or taken into account everything that had been fully visible to you or to others on how you actually performed. See, we've taken this process into church, the wisdom of this age, into how we run churches and evaluate our leadership, consciously or subconsciously. We start to look at seats filled. We start to take a look at funds collected, Sundays preached, and evaluate our leaders by these measures, or even worse, how they compare to other preachers, other pastors, we may have heard on TV or on the radio or seen in person. God's evaluation is different. It's complete, has full view deep into the soul. A pastor who focuses on God's work and his evaluation is free to preach truth, to speak at the direction of the Holy Spirit based on the flock's needs rather than dance around donations. Or if I say this, this family will leave, or say that, she will withhold her tithe. See, under God's evaluation, a leader is free to focus on God's work, not the judgment of man, or living for the approval of others. Paul goes on to say, I don't even judge myself. Oh, wait a second here. Paul, you, were, <laughs> you had humility earlier. What's going on? It sounds arrogant of you, but it really isn't. This is the second type of judgment he focuses on. In fact, I don't even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself yet I'm not by this acquitted. So many of our pastors have stress-related health issues because they carry the burden of judgments passed on them by their congregation. And then they move to begin to judge themselves. It affects their health, physical and mental. They begin to question themselves, their calling. This affects their families too. I've seen so many pastor's kids leave the church, leave God, all because of what? The judgments passed on their father. The judgments their father passed on himself. Many of us do this to ourselves. We're so self-conscious, we become immobilized. See, Paul is different here. He's sure of himself. He's sure of his faith. He says, I don't recognize I've done something wrong. There's a level of confidence here. He's not going to be sucked down into despair or compare. His worth, his value, his calling comes from above. Now, if you remember, we mentioned humility earlier. Paul gives us a picture of confident humility. He's not a mat to be walked on, but he acknowledges that he's not aware of wrongdoings. He's not perfect. He's not acquitted. I believe many Corinthians reading this or hearing this understood this from a worldly view, though. You see, they looked at this the way Socrates and Plato taught, to know thyself. And they understood that. That verse or that statement was written on their temple walls. But what Paul was talking about here is to know thyself, know your limits. You see, it's good to stand firm on your convictions, to be confident of your be beliefs and callings, but it's equally important to recognize that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Not one of us, not any of us is perfect. We have all sinned. So it's good to look inward, to self-evaluate, but let's not forget, we are not acquitted. Paul recognized this, and so should we. Judging oneself can also be as negative and destructive as judging others. Paul again is saying here he is not above men. If he doesn't submit to man's judgment, he doesn't submit to himself, because he's also a man, fallible, simply not qualified to judge, just like his fellow man. So now we come to the heart of the matter. We are judged by God. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, 
But wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come from him, from God. For in Psalm 7, verse 9, it says, For the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. The literal translation says the hearts and kidneys, the life function of the body. God knows what makes us tick, what motivates us, beyond the action itself, the drive, what gives us life. He is the one righteous judge that can truly evaluate our stewardship. He has given us the calling. It is only he that can judge if we can be found faithful. See, it's like the master who gave the talents to the servants and then came back to evaluate. The one who hid the money did nothing. He thought he was being safe. Others thought he was being safe. But it wasn't what the master wanted. He was judged and found guilty. We need to rely less on what others think or even what we think and focus on what God wants us to do and what he has called us to do, to make the right call based on what he wants. Well, some of you maybe are, are, are a little bit like me. You couldn't wait for baseball season to return. See, I like the Nats. I like walking, watching the Nats, but I love my Cubbies and watching my Cubbies. I like to watch and make calls on balls or strikes. That wasn't a ball, that was a strike. What we call in Chicago, bleacher umpire, as I'm sure many of you have done. Well, for those baseball fanatics, you probably or may recognize a player turned umpire named Ralph Babe Pinelli. Well, Pinelli in 1935 in his rookie umpire year stood behind the plate and who comes along except Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth comes up, strike one, strike two, strike three. The crowd goes in an uproar. Everybody's screaming, bad call. Don't you have eyes, can't you see? And Babe Ruth turned to con with contempt to Pinelli and said there are 40,000 people here that would say that was a ball. Well, players, coaches, all were bracing themselves for Babe to be thrown out. He was challenging the umpire. Well, Pinelli, with all cool and calmness, turns to Babe and says, well, I beg to differ with you. You see, they can all have this call, but it's my call that counts. It's only my call that counts. That may be so. It's my call that counts. And that's what God is saying. Everybody can pass a judgment, but it's my judgment that counts. We need to rely on less on what others think or even what we think and focus on what God wants. Church, we need to realize that God's judgment is the only one and we resist the temptation to form allegiances, favorites, or past judgment, make calls made on limited information, limited by our human capacity. These judgments only divide, cause trouble. We need to rely on God's sovereign choices for our lives. I've heard some say, I'm not going to church today. Wes is speaking, or Frank is speaking, <laughs> or better yet, William is speaking. Or I've heard some people say, I like Scott better. Or I've heard, actually heard this, Scott wasn't on his A-game today. Or Scott isn't is preaching as well. Well, you see, what we're really saying is that we are going to church to hear a man speak, to hear how eloquent he was, much like the Corinthians did. Rather than hear God speak through them, and Scott, if you're listening, I'm sorry, <laughs> let's be freed of judgment of one another and focus on God's judgment, his calling, his great commission. Let us be free to hear the Holy Spirit, not man, not Wes, not Frank, not William, not Scott. Our decisions, what do they say? Do our decisions, do our calls, judgment, show a servant's humility? Rowing the ship, moving it forward, are we good stewards of what we are called to do? Focusing on God's judgment to please him, not our fellow man, not ourselves. Well, in closing, I hope you're never put in a situation like Churchill was, where lives were at stake. But today, as you make your calls, as you make your judgments about going to college, taking on a career, moving, finding a spouse, homeschooling, or online schooling, sharing the gospel with a friend or a stranger, do we honor him in all we do?
Or are we worried about what the others may think? Am I worried about what this person would say if I said the name Christ out loud? May we be found to be a hopiritas o kinemos, an under roller, a house steward of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come in front of you realizing how flawed we are, realizing that we are a broken vessel, but we trust in your judgment. We trust in your full knowledge, knowing our full potential, and we trust that your Holy Spirit can fill us, can use us to your glory. We ask that you make us a humble servant, a steward of your mysteries, to pass out the word, the gospel, the good news to those around us, that your son had came to this earth. He died on a cross, was buried, but then rose again to give us salvation. His blood covers our sin, and for that we're forever grateful. Help us to make the right call today. Help us to consider what you want us to do, not what others or what we want to do. We ask this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. I'll ask the deacons to come forward.